Hi, how's everybody doing tonight? All right, now, <clears throat> my name is Mike King, our line. Um, I'm a youth organizer at Teen Empowerment located in the Southwest community. <laughs> Thank you. Um, we're located in the Southwest community of, um, of Rochester, New York. Um, and could you guys say hello to my fellow youth organizers? All right, today we'll be accompanying you during you know, the discussion. And my job is to come up here and tell you guys, we got about five minutes to the discussion. So if everybody could find their seats, you know, turn off the phones. We don't need nobody getting no calls, you know? <laughs> and we think get this on the road, all right? All right, thank you. Good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining us. Uh, I first want to introduce uh, my fellow founders of Frederick Douglass Family Initiatives. First of all, say hello to Nettie Washington Douglas. Nettie is the great-great-granddaughter of Frederick Douglass, and she's the great-granddaughter of Booker T. Washington. And tell him who you are. Yeah. Also, say hello to Kenneth B. Morris, Jr. Uh, add one more great to his name uh, of those things. He's the great-great-great-grandson of Frederick Douglass. He's the great-great-grandson of Booker T. Washington. Say hello to Kenneth B. Morris. My name is Robert Benz. I am uh, also a co-founder of Frederick Douglass Family Initiatives. Nettie. Yes. <laughs> so everyone is, I know already, but everyone's wondering, how could you possibly be a direct descendant of both Frederick Douglass and Booker T. Washington? Do tell. Do tell, do tell. OK. I have several versions, but <laughs> because of time constraints tonight, I'm going to do the brief one. And every time I say this, like I'm saying it for the first time, because I can't believe it either. Had nothing to do with it. However, I'm very honored to have the honor. Um, my mother, Nettie Hancock Washington, her maiden name, Nettie Hancock Washington, was the granddaughter of Booker T. Washington. Her father was Booker Jr. My father was Frederick Douglass III. And uh, she was born in Tuskegee, Tuskegee Institute, as I was later. My dad was born in D.C., so they didn't travel in the same circles as people used to say. Well, maybe, you know, they travel in the same circles. No. My mother grew up in California. She was home for the summer uh, in Tuskegee for two weeks to visit family and friends. My father, in 1941, in August, had been commissioned uh, to go to the VA hospital in Tuskegee, which was the only black VA hospital during World War II. He was a surgeon. He was on a dinner break. A dinner break. He was on a night shift. And this night, instead of eating in the hospital cafeteria, the medical staff knew that they could go walk across campus and eat in the student dining hall. And this night, August 1941, he's walking across campus to eat. My mother is running late to go where she's going. She's taking a shortcut across campus. And they literally bumped into each other. and were married three months later. They were married three months later in Booker Washington's home, and here I stand. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you. That, that, that was the short version. Uh, Ken, let's talk about students. Do you see any students here tonight? I'm not sure I did. Are there any students in here tonight? Wait, wait, wait a minute now. Y'all got to talk to me. Are there any students in here tonight? Okay, that, 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 that's better. Now we're getting together. That's better. So, 
Aren't there young people involved in the program tonight? There are p young people involved in the program. When, when we get started, uh, first we're going to have Dr. Kendi address you, talk about his amazing book, How to Be an Anti-Racist. And then we're inviting uh, four panelists up uh, to uh, talk about Rochester-specific things. And we've also got uh, four students to uh, frame their questions uh, from a youth perspective. And we want to thank Sean Nelms, Lynn. Yes, go ahead. <laughs> Lynn Gervin and these East High School students. <laughs> and we have to thank Teen Empowerment. We also would like to recognize this evening FDFI's 2019 Frederick Douglass Human Rights Award winners, and that's Ruth and Dr. David Anderson. Are you in the house? Just David is here. David is here. Where is David? Yes. Thank you. A few months ago, one of our super supporters passed away unexpectedly. His name was Gary Caldwell. And tonight his wife has come to join us, Becca from Pittsburgh, and we want to recognize her this evening. Becca, where are you? Please stand up. Thank you very much for being here. We also want to thank uh, Hochstein for uh, being so accommodating, thank you. Uh, and we want to thank our sponsors. First of all, we're very grateful for uh, uh, being new in town. Uh, our sponsors have been very supportive, uh, and I, I think it's a sign of great collaboration around this issue. Uh, Ken, Nettie, Nettie, you want to you want to start with uh, talking about our sponsors? The Allen family. That would be Todd, Ruth, and their son Luke. Fortunately, we have a lot of sponsors, so let's leave the applause for the end. <laughs> <laughs> City of Rochester. And especially Mayor Lovely Warren. The Community Foundation. Thank you. East High School. Eric and Michelle Daniels, but I have to just take a second to add on. Another congratulations. We were at the UNCF luncheon today, the Mayor's Luncheon, and they were both honored with the Frederick Douglass Patterson Award, and they got a key to the city. No. Congratulations again, you two. ESL Foundation, Excellus, Frederick Douglass Housing Corporation, Friends and Foundation of the Rochester Public Library, SUNY Geneseo, and Assembly Member Harry Bronson. We were at uh, Harry's uh, campaign launch yesterday. It's, I, I'm, I don't know if he's going to win or not, but I'm guessing he's going to take a lot of votes from Bernie Sanders and uh, Elizabeth Warren. So get in there. I'll continue on with Huther Doyle. The I, I thought more. I was going to get a better lap for that one. I, uh, <laughs> well, well, we'll strike. We'll edit that out of the yeah, video. Let your people know who Harry Bronson is. <laughs> The Innovative Edge Memorial Art Gallery, Rochester Contemporary Art Center, Rochester Institute of Technology, Rochester Public Library, Rock Growth, St. Joseph's Neighborhood Center, St. John's Fisher College, Writers and Books, and WXXI. Thank you all very much, our sponsors. Nettie's going to give us a hint about an upcoming event that we have. Yes. Next year in Rochester, FDFI will host Frederick Douglass Honors Women's Rights Through a Racial Lens. We will spotlight the centennial of the 19th Amendment and the contributions of women to American democracy. Rochester and the surrounding region, where the center of the women's suffrage movement and this event will help mobilize voter registration and enthusiasm prior to the November 3rd, 2020 election. 
FDFI will invite prominent national, regional, and local women of influence to discuss the history of suffrage and some of the issues facing women today. Yeah. Something that we always ask ourselves whenever we sit down to plan a project is, what would Frederick Douglass do? In his composite nationality speech, Douglass explained that nationhood, quote, implies a willing surrender and subjection of individual aims and ends, often narrow and selfish, to the broader and better ones that arise out of society as a whole. It is both a sign and a result of civilization, end quote. Now, if we really believe in this definition of nationhood, then it should definitely apply to community as well. And we want to know how can Rochester become a model of a truly equitable community? Okay, before we get started, I want to give a shout out to uh, FDFI board members that are in the audience, Todd Allen and Carvin Eisen. Thank you. And I want to bring up FDFI's team. Uh, please say hello to Dr. Hank Rubin. Dr. Rubin, Dr. Rubin. Tiana Stevens, Kristen Leary, Tiana Stevens, Kristen Leary, no one's listening back there. I, yeah, yeah. Oh, okay. Leah Scafido, Erica Mock, Awen Joseph, and Renita Williams, come join us. One more thing before we introduce Dr. Kendi. Okay, now we're in for a great evening, and um, this is the part where we do a little bit of fundraising and social media. Um, so if you all can, up oh, and Kristen Leary, oh, yeah. and there's Erica Mock. So if you can take out your cell phones, or you want to write this down, don't turn your cell phones on, but If you text HISTORY to 71777, and for those of you that don't know how to text keywords to donate, you can ask a young person in the audience and they can help you. Say it again, 71777, and then type in the keyword HISTORY and hit SEND and you'll get a link back from us, and you will be able to connect to our page where you can give a donation, donation if you like, or if you're interested in hosting a fundraiser for us, there's a button there as well. So you can make a donation or click become a fundraiser, and we truly would appreciate your support and thank you for doing that. And we'll give you this information one time before we're finished this evening. So thank you all very much. We appreciate it. Oh, some social media hashtags for you Twitter folks and Facebook folks. Hashtag how to be an anti-racist. So if you're tweeting tonight or posting on Facebook, use how to be an anti-racist, the hashtag be an anti-racist, and hashtag ROC. And then on Twitter, you can follow us at Douglas Family. You can follow Dr. Kendi at Dr. Ebram. And then you can also follow me at K Morris Jr. K Morris Jr. Now to introduce Dr. Kendi, Awin Joseph, and Renita Williams. Thank you. What a beautiful evening. I am very thrilled to be here with you today. My name is Awin Joseph, and I am an intern at the Frederick Douglass Family Initiatives. I currently attend the University of Rochester where I double major in anthropology as well as gender, sexuality, and women's studies. I am so thrilled to be here today to start conversations around making Rochester and even the world a truly equitable community. I would like to use the floor quickly before turning to my colleague Renita to announce a huge event that will occur on June 9th, 2020. I know, I know, it sounds so far out, but I promise it will come quickly. 
So June 9th, 2020, is going to be the rededication of the original statue of Frederick Douglass, which was recently relocated to a more prominent and visible location within Island Park. So I have to say, as a Haitian woman, I am very proud and honored to be witnessing this event, as Haiti, after it gained its independence in 1804, made it a mission to support Latinx and black countries and their leaders. Haiti was also one of the first supporters of the building of monuments showcasing black veterans and heroes, as well as Frederick Douglass. The country helped many leaders and countries fight the abolition of slavery and endorsed the construction of the first statue featuring an African-American who was no one else but Frederick Douglass, who, by the way, was also a US ambassador to Haiti in 1889. Good evening, everyone. I am Renita Williams, an intern with the Frederick, with Frederick Douglass Family Initiatives and a senior at St. John Fisher College. Thank you. At Fisher, I major in Inclusive Adolescent Education and American Studies. And I am privileged to introduce to you a person who has worked closely with Frederick Douglass Family Initiatives for the past two years. As recently as earlier this year at the Library of Congress, as we celebrated the end of the Frederick Douglass Bicentennial, where we honored 200 people that embodied the spirit and the work of Douglass as part of the FD 200. He is a man whose name means peace and strives to bring peace to America by making it his life's work to bring awareness to racial inequality, the policies that allow racial inequality to happen, and teach others how to be anti-racist. He said himself that racial inequality is a problem of bad policy, not bad people. Through, through his works, he has become an influential person in the fight to help understand, explain, and solve the difficult problems of racial inequality and injustice. Now please, help me give a Rochester welcome to the man who wrote, stamped from the beginning, as well, the reason we are here tonight, how to be anti-racist, Dr. Dr. Ibram X. Kendi. Good evening, Rochester. I didn't know y'all were this lit in Rochester. It's, it's truly an honor for me to, to be here this evening. Of course, when you receive an, an invitation from one of America's first families, the Douglas family, and you receive an invitation from one of the organizations that I, that I personally hold most dear, the Frederick Douglass Family Initiatives, and you come to a city where Frederick Douglass literally shared most of, if many of his life work. And I, you know, I'm from DC, and so I, we try to claim Frederick Douglass too. <laughs> but I know y'all have first dibs on Frederick, okay? <laughs> and, and so it's truly an honor for me to be here this evening to, to talk to you a little bit about how to be an anti-racist. Is, is that okay? And you know, I, I should say at the outset that you know, I wrote this book before How to Be an Anti-Racist. I wrote this book, Stamp from the Beginning, which was this very small history of racist ideas. <laughs> OK, it was a little longer. And you know, it was over 500 pages. And, and I, you know, I, I felt I needed that much and that many pages in order to chronicle America's long history of, of racist ideas. But I realized that I could have literally just produced a single sentence 
to explain America's history of racist ideas. And that single sentence was actually published by Frederick Douglass in a speech in Rochester in 1854. And in that sentence, he said, when men oppress their fellow men, the oppressor ever finds in the character of the oppressed a full justification for his oppression. And Frederick Douglass was, was, was speaking against this book that had been published in 1853 entitled Types of Mankind. And, and that was actually the title. In other words, the, the book made a case that there were several types of men, for the lack of a better term. That, in fact, every race was a different species of being. In the way, you know, horses are a different species of being than dogs. That's how these scholars, who at the time were, 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 were known as polygenesists, imagined the races. In other words, they, they argued that, that every race had its own creation story, that every race was created independently of one another, that every race was its own species of being with its own biology, which its own a sort of ways of knowing and being in the world. And of course, these polygenesis made the case that, that the white species was the most superior species. And, and they made the case that the black species was more closer to animal species than they were to the white species. And so Frederick Douglass, challenging this book called Types of Mankind, again argued in a speech that he gave in Cleveland, but ultimately was published here in Rochester in, in 1854. He said, when men oppress their fellow men, the oppressor ever finds in the character of the oppressed a full justification for his oppression. And then if I could add, first family, if I could say a little bit more to that, I would add, and then the oppressor says they're not racist. <laughs> Just as those polygenesists who were making the case that, that the white species was the most superior species and, and the black species was, was, was closer to the apes, they were also saying, you know, this is science. You know, what we've done, we've actually measured skulls from different races and the skulls of, of, of white people were bigger than the black skulls and so therefore, whoever has bigger skulls apparently have bigger brains, and that's a demonstration of the biological distinction. I'm just telling you what they were arguing. <laughs> and, 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 and what was ironic, though, I should say, is there were also a group of people called monogenesists who, who challenged these polygenesists, and, and these monogenesists said, you know what, we're, we're all created equal. But actually, they stated, we all came from Adam and Eve. And then they also argued that Adam and Eve were white. <laughs> and they argued the Garden of Eden was in Europe. And they said that the descendants of, these white descendants of Adam and Eve at, at, at some point decided for some crazy reason to venture into the South and they arrived in Africa and, and, and that's when their beautiful white skins were blackened and made ugly. And so that's how blackness came to be. Monogenesis argued. Polygenesis were like, no, they were born in Africa. Polygenesis, monogenesis was like, no, we were all created equal. They became that way on earth. Now, Douglas thought they were both crazy. <laughs> but what monogenesis also made the case was 
since the ancestors of black people were white, we have the capacity to make them white again. And you know how we make them white again? We just urge black people who are living in Charleston, South Carolina, to migrate up to Rochester. <laughs> and they'll go from those hot areas that are blackening their sun, and then they'll go to those cold areas in Rochester where their blackness will become white again. Now, there's, I see a lot of black faces in here. Apparently, that didn't work. <laughs> but that's what they argued. And it, this was the debate between racists that Douglas and others had to challenge. Now, I should also argue that the monogenesis also said they were not racist. So polygenesis were like, you know, this is science. This is nature's law. We have measured the skulls. This is empirical knowledge. While monogenesis were like, this is God's law. Adam and Eve, you've read Genesis. Okay, I didn't really read the part where Adam and Eve were white or where the Garden of Eden was in Europe, but apparently they made the case that they're not racist, that in fact they are preaching God's law. This is the gospel. And, and, and the reason why I keep emphasizing this, this idea of these two kinds of racists, both making the case that there was something wrong with black people, one making the case that, that blackness was permanent and eternal, and the other making the case that, that blackness is temporary, that, that we have the case to make these ugly black people white again. Both of these theorists were simultaneously saying they're not racist, just as they still do today. So Americans are still engaged in the same racial debate. And what I mean by the same racial debate is the same debate between racists. And, and this is the debate over why are black people inferior? And you have one set of racists that will say they're genetically and biologically and thereby permanently inferior. That, that black people, that Latinx people, are basically like animals. And, and because they're like animals, they need to be caged in those segregated parts of town, in those cells. They need to be deported. They need to be killed. While the descendants of monogenesis are like, you know, what actually is happening, the, the reason why these, these people are inferior is because they, they were born and raised in these broken communities and broken families with broken homes. And, and since we're all created equal, and since their inferiority is largely cultural and behavioral, we have the capacity to civilize these people. It is our job as a racial reformer to bring these people cultural and behavioral enrichment. Because that's what's plaguing black America, their cultural and behavioral ways. And these assimilationists, during Douglass's time, just as our time, have imagined that they were progressive. Have imagined that those segregationists who were more like slaveholders in Douglass's time were the real racists. You, you read about Douglass's history, one of the most fascinating aspects of his story is how he had to battle against abolitionists. He had to battle against abolitionists who, when he went on the speaking circuit, he wanted to not only share his story, his incredible, uplifting story, of course, of, of, of running away from the clutches of enslavement, of emerging as this incredible sort of speaker. But, but he also wanted to provide his own ideas about slavery, his own ideas about liberation. And, and some of the other early white abolitionists who were, quote, handling him were like, no, just, just tell your story. 
we will handle the philosophy. That, that's not your job. And then you also had white people who he would speak to would say, he's never been a slave. He's too articulate. No, I mean, I'm just, I mean, ask Nettie and Ken. That's what they would say. He's just too articulate. There's no way he could have been a slave. And, and so then they would ask him to perform. They essentially wanted him to be a minstrel show because that connected with how they perceived black people. They wanted a performer. They didn't want an intellectual. All the while, they were like, well, we're not like those slaveholders down south. We're progressive. We're liberal. We're northerners. And so therefore, we're not racist. And it's the same today. And, and really what I'm getting at is how Americans in 1854, just as Americans today, commonly self-identify as not racist. No matter what racial idea they just said, no matter what policymakers they support, no matter what policies they support or oppose, Americans across the ideological aisle, from Charleston, South Carolina to Rochester, from Rochester to Berkeley, Democrats, Republicans, independents, people of color, white people, you name it, they consider themselves to be not racist. Am I lying? And what's ironic is Americans will swear that they are not racist. And, you know, people like me is like, okay, are you sure you're not racist? Yes, I'm sure I'm not racist. Are you really, really sure? Yes, I'm really sure. Give me that Bible. I'll put my hand on that. Okay, I didn't ask for all of that. I'm just asking, are you sure? Yes, I am sure I am not racist. Okay, why are you so sure? Well, because I'm a Democrat. <laughs> and, and only Republicans are racist. Or they'll say, you know what? I'm, I, I, I vote for the Green Party, and only Democrats and Republicans are racist. Or, I'm radical, and only liberals, moderates, and conservatives are racist. Or, I'm conservative, and only liberals are racist. Y'all get the point? Or, they say, they don't just say now, right, that I have a black friend. That they've graduated to they, they've graduated to, there's a black person in my reading group. There's a Latinx person at my job, and we exchanged coffee the other day. But what's ironic is people would swear they're not racist, but that means they must know what a racist is. Americans commonly consider themselves to be, quote, not racist, while Americans commonly can't define the term racist. Young people, isn't that a contradiction? <laughs> if you know you're not something, you must know what that something is. But what that is indicative of is that really the heartbeat of racism has always been denial. What was so frustrating for Douglas and other abolitionists was you had so many slaveholders who commonly thought that they commonly said that they weren't doing anything wrong. And if anyone was doing something wrong, it was people like Douglas. That they were, in our term, not racist. That black people are the cursed descendants of Ham. So we're, we're doing God's will. Black people were, were, were living for, for thousands of years in barbaric Africa. Apparently, they said that we were just running around and running into and hanging out in bushes until suddenly the white man came and we learned civilization. And then they brought us over, these slaveholders said, into the civilizing environment of the plantation. So if anything, we're helping these people. If anything, these slaveholders said, that slavery is a positive good. 
So Douglas had to deal with slaveholders from the mid-1830s until the end of Civil War, arguing commonly that slavery was a positive good. And then he, like Americans, witnessed Reconstruction and its fall by 1876. And by the 1880s, you had this mass disenfranchisement campaign going on. You, you had southern states being segregated. And then those new Jim Crow segregationists were like, we're not racist. The South is perfectly separate but equal. And these outside agitators, like Douglas, continue to come down here and mess up the harmonious relations between the races. It was better during slavery, but it's still good now. And you're messing it up. These are the arguments they would make. Just as during the era of mass incarceration, they were arguing Democrats and Republicans that were mass incarcerating super predators. We're doing a good deed. We're making America safe. No matter that during the height of mass incarceration from 1993 to 2009, the majority of people arrested were arrested for drug crimes, no matter that the majority of those drug crimes were nonviolent drug crimes, no matter that the majority of those nonviolent drug crimes were possession-related drug crimes. No, we're taking angry, violent predators off the street. And the people who are in prisons are rapists and murderers are kin killers. Even though what was happening is you had people who had a drug problem who should have been receiving treatment, who were being incarcerated. And then they were being released from prison as they're being released now from prison, and then they're having to mark a box that they were a felon. They struggle to get a job. They can't get public assistance to get public housing. They struggle to get financial aid for college. And then when they struggle to, to, to put themselves on their own two feet outside of prison, and they are not able to do that, who do we blame? Them. Anyway, don't get me started. So, <laughs> and, and so all the while, right, Americans, Democrats and Republicans, who were mass incarcerating black and brown people, and even many poor whites, were, were classifying themselves as, as not racist, just as now during this era of mass deportation. You have the current president stating that what? We're, we're deporting rapists and murderers and criminals. Now, last I checked, American citizens are actually more likely to commit a crime than immigrants. But, you know, of course, I mean, but that's a fact. I mean, who cares about facts? <laughs> I live in Washington, D.C. They say, what? F fact? Can you say? I never heard that word before. Can you say that word? Truth? No. What? what? No. We do alternative facts now. And so even people today who, who imagine that Latinx people are invading this country and taking away their own livelihood. And thereby, they decide that they're going to get an assault rifle and go to a Walmart in El Paso, Texas, and try to shoot and kill as many of these so-called Latinx invaders as possible. But before they do so, they upload online this manifesto claiming they're what? Not racist. And so it's across the board. Even white nationalists, you even Congressman Steve King in his interview with the New York Times, in which he said, what's wrong with the term white supremacist, was also quoted in that same article as, I'm not racist. Do y'all get the point? The, the, really the point that I've been trying to make for a little bit is that this construct of not racist emerges from this sentence of, 
I'm not racist, which typically emerges when a person who is being racist is charged with being racist, that their response is, I'm not racist. Their response is to deny that they are racist. Their response is that way because the heartbeat of racism itself is denial. And let's contrast that with being anti-racist. So when someone in this country says that black people are lazy, and another person in this country says, you know what, what you just said was racist. You're being racist. What a racist does is, I'm not racist. That's just a fact, you know, black people are twice as likely to be unemployed and there's all these jobs out here, so they just must be unemployed because they don't want to work. So you're saying you have data that actually proves black people are lazy? No, I'm making an inference based on other sets of data. Okay, I just wanted to make sure. But I'm not racist. But when an anti-racist, what someone who is striving to be anti-racist says is, you know what? What I just said was indeed racist. You know what? I was being racist. So what a, what a racist does is they deny. What an anti-racist does is they confess. They admit. They acknowledge. They recognize that it's incredibly hard to, to be born in a country with racist ideas reigning in your head throughout your whole life in which you've never had an umbrella and to essentially never get wet. That we're going to get wet that we're going to be drenched with racist ideas, that, that we're going to end up following policies that are indeed racist without necessarily knowing it. And so then when another person points it out to us, what someone who is striving to be anti-racist does is, you know what? You're right. I am, I am being racist. That idea is racist. That policy is racist. Because in order to be anti-racist, we must admit when we're being racist. But the American does not want to admit. And we wonder why the America remains racist. We haven't as a nation, and we haven't as a people, been willing to admit the fact that we have racial disparities and inequities all around us, not because there's something wrong with a particular racial group, not because there's something right about a particular racial group. We have racial inequities and disparities all around us because we have racist policies all around us. And the reason why so many of us have been misled into believing that the cause of those inequities are what's wrong with a particular racial group as opposed to those policies is because the policymakers who are behind those policies who are benefiting from those policies want you and I to be looking at people as the problem as opposed to their policies. In other words, as a slaveholder that's making money, you want people to not think that there's something wrong with slavery. You want people to think there's nothing wrong with the policies substantiating slavery. There's nothing wrong with the policies that allow for the terror to maintain slavery. That the reason why slavery exists is because these people should be enslaved. This is normal. That's what you want. Why? Because you don't want an America. You don't want Frederick Douglass. You don't want other people telling Americans that slavery is the most evil thing that humankind has ever seen. You don't want people thinking that, believing that, because once they start thinking that and, and believing that and, and seeing slavery for the terror that it is, what are they going to do? They're going to start resisting it. They're going to start resisting what you benefit from. And so, again, that is why the oppressor is seeking to justify his or her oppression through the character of the oppressed because then it normalizes the inequity. When we believe in racial hierarchy, when we see racial hierarchy, it's going to seem normal. 
And so fundamentally, to be anti-racist is to fundamentally see the racial groups as equals. It's to say that there's nothing wrong or even right about any racial group. It's to recognize that because the racial groups are equals, that if we have racial inequities, they must be the result of racist policies. To recognize that there are policymakers who are instituting those policies out of self-interest, to see that those policymakers are trying to convince Americans that those policies are actually in their self-interest or that those policies should be in place so that they can continue to benefit from them. I mean, y'all mind if I speak plainly? She's like, I mean, you've been speaking plainly this whole time. So I think one of the most, one of the most important aspects of my findings about this racism problem is that racism has disproportionately harmed people of color. And as a result, if you are a policymaker instituting policies that are disproportionately harming people of color, then you're going to first and foremost want those people of color to think that there's something wrong with themselves as opposed to those policies. Because they're the first and most likely to resist your policies. You're going to want black people to believe they should be enslaved. You're going to want black people in Rochester to believe they should be disproportionately poor. You're going to want black people to believe they should be on this segregated part of town. Because then they're not going to resist. And your policies will continue to persist and you'll continue to be able to benefit from them. But what we should also understand is that if you're a policymaker, if you're one of those few thousand white families owning slaves in the South in 1860, you're not only going to want those four million enslaved people to believe slavery is normal, you're going to want those five million poor, non-slaveholding whites to believe slavery is normal. You're going to want them to conceptualize America from the standpoint of what they can lose as opposed to what they could gain. In other words, because white people disproportionately benefit from racism, you're going to want to convince white people that it's in your interest to maintain racist policies. Why? Because you benefit more than people of color even though in a different type of America you would actually benefit more than the America we have right now. Just like those five million poor whites. You know, we talk about equalizing the schools. People are like, so my school is going to be like that poor black school down the road? No, your school is going to be like that school that the super rich send their kids to in New England. So you're saying that if, 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 if we provide health care for people, those black people are going to get health care? No, you're going to get health care. <laughs> <laughs> and you know what's going to happen? You're not going to be one major illness away from bankruptcy. So, so you're saying that if we institute policies that challenge bigotry in this country, including racism, that I'm not going to be able to continue to maintain my privilege? No, you're not. But you know what's also going to happen? That person who is a man, who has male privilege, he's not going to be able to use his. That, that person who is heterosexual is not going to be able to use hers. That person who is rich is not going to be able to use his privilege. That person, y'all get the point? Because racism fundamentally is reinforced by every other form of bigotry. They reinforce each other. And so if anybody is concerned about a bigotry that's affecting them, chances are 
it's being reinforced and strengthened by racism. So to fight against racism is to fight against sexism. To fight against racism is to fight against economic inequality. To, to fight against racism is to fight against homophobia. To fight against racism is to fight against those crazy New Yorkers. <laughs> what I mean by New Yorkers, I'm talking about folks from Queens and Brooklyn. <laughs> okay. And so what I'm ultimately arguing, and then I'm gonna shut up and then we'll, we'll have a conversation, is that to be anti-racist, no one necessarily has to be altruistic. All we need people to do is actually do what's in their intelligent self-interest. For members of the middle class to recognize that the likelihood that you're going to be a billionaire, and so therefore supporting policies that allow for the continuous running of wealth to the top is actually not in your self-interest. For people to literally recognize that, yes, your school has more, but it could have more for your child in a different type of society. But then, one of the things that I'm realizing is that, you know, people truly don't want a meritocracy. And especially, they don't want a meritocracy in schools. And you know why they don't want a meritocracy in schools? Because they don't really believe their kids are smart. No, I mean, if your kid is smart, then it's like, equalize the schools. It doesn't matter. My kid will excel. If your kid is not smart, oh, nope. I need privileges and advantages and resources. I mean, am I lying? And not just for people's kids, themselves. They don't really believe who they think, who they say they are. They don't really believe that they are that hardworking, that they are that accomplished. Because if they did, you know, for me, when I really thought that I was going to win, I'd be like, it doesn't matter what rules we have. I'm going to beat you in spades no matter what. <laughs> Anybody play spades? <laughs> but, but, but one of the things I'm realizing is, is so many people, and when I say people, I'm talking about moderates and liberals and progressives who critique the president, are just like the president. They're just as cocky as the president. They have this exaggerated sense of self. Because if they had a real sense of self, anyway, I didn't mean to go on that tangent, but. <laughs> and, and so ultimately, all that people have to do is do what's best for their life. Because last I checked, having universal high quality health care for all is good for all people. <laughs> last I checked, battling against voter suppression is good for all Americans. <laughs> last I checked, decriminalizing marijuana so y'all can go smoke and not, you know, get, get all incarcerated is good for all Americans. And so ultimately, to be anti-racist is to be someone who is not going to be duped, is not going to be manipulated by racist ideas to do things and say things that are actually not in their own self-interest. And, and I'm saying this to say, we've, we've spent a lot of time criticizing white working people and white poor people for acting against their self-interest. It's the same thing with white, white middle income people. It's the same thing. White middle income people have allied with wealthy white people as opposed to working people and working poor people. Why? Because they've been manipulated by racist ideas for decades. Now, I think there's some white people getting woke now. They're waking up. Trump had to smack it out of them. <laughs> but I'm just hoping that this will be the start of something new that this will be the start of a new America, the America that Frederick Douglass was dreaming of after he was able 
like many others, particularly people who were enslaved, were able to drive off the clutches of slavery in this country. He dreamed of a different type of America, an America in which people truly had equal opportunity, people truly had equal resources, the type of nation that humans throughout human history have been dreaming about. He believed that was possible in this country. And I still believe it's possible in this country. Thank you. Dr. Ibram Kendi, yes. We knew Rochester was this lit. <laughs> yes. So ladies and gentlemen, uh, first of all, a couple of programming notes. Um, young people in the audience, uh, we will have a free copy of the narrative of the life of Frederick Douglass for you. Any young people again? Yes, young people, books. If you go back into the hall, we define young people uh, uh, one to three. Any one to three year olds? No. Young people, uh, you know who you are. Uh, so Ken and, Nine, Ken and Eddie will sign your books. Uh, just go into the room to the left of the, of the hallway. Uh, Ibram will be signing some books afterwards also. And uh, what else? I'm going to introduce you uh, to someone who's going to take over from here, our moderator, Tiana Magnon. Sorry, I'm a little shorter. I wore heels and everything. Hi, everyone. I'm Tiana Magnon. I am a journalist and publicist, and I'm just really excited to dig into this dichotomy a lot deeper. I don't know about you, but I devoured that book. Um, I think it's obvious when it comes to being an anti-racist, there's so much work to be done. So tonight we're going to discuss ways to do exactly that, ways to put you all into action, literally tonight, tomorrow morning at the latest, and also some of the racist power system structures and everything that we're up against so that you have a better understanding of that as well. So first, I actually want to introduce you to our student participants. All of them are scholars from East High School, and they will be helping us with some of the questions tonight. So as I introduce them, they're going to come out here, and they'll take a seat on the uh, far stools. Kaori is a senior who is academically ranked in the top 10 of his graduating class. He is the captain of both the varsity volleyball and basketball teams, and he plans to attend college for business administration. Woo! <laughs> Go for it. <laughs> Next up, we have Juna Lise. She is a junior who plays volleyball, and she's also a cheerleader. She plans to attend college, and she'll be doing so for veterinary science. Next up, we have Jahim. He is a senior, he is active in music, he performs in the jazz band, and he plays piano. <laughs> Perfect. Um, and then we'll also bring out Jessaline. She is a junior who started the bilingual club at East. She models for charity groups and plans on attending college for business management. They have very difficult questions in store for our panelists tonight, so let's bring out our panelists next. First up, we have Brandon White. He is a poet, an MC, an author, and a current ELA specialist for Unbound Ed. He is also a former middle school ELA teacher and a restorative practices educator with the Rochester City School District. <laughs> Next. 
Next, we have Dr. Candace Lucas. She is the Executive Director of St. Joseph Neighborhood Center. It's a nonprofit agency that provides comprehensive, integrated medical, dental, mental health care to people who lack adequate health insurance. Next up, we have Heidi Zimmermeyer, and she is the president of RDDC. She is also on the Rock 2025's economic development leadership team, and she sits on the Rock the Riverway management entity working group. Last but certainly not least is Rachel Y. de Guzman. She is the award-winning president and CEO of 21st Century Arts. And she is the founder director of Woke Art Collaborative. And she is focused on decentering whiteness and arts culture and wants to include voices of people of color. So give us just uh, two minutes and we're going to set this up and we'll get started. Perfect. Thank you all so much for your patience. Um, so I think our first question is going to come from Kaori, if you can kick us off. Ms. Zimmermeyer, how is racism shaping our economy? Oh, thank you. <laughs> Ms. Zimmermeyer, how is racism shaping our economy? Thank you, Kaori. Um, I think in a lot of ways. Uh, in many ways deep and broad across the economy. I think we need to understand that businesses are chasing talent all across the U.S. And um, from a, a very strictly an economic point of view, frankly, uh, we have a tremendous loss of capital, human capital, that we see in our cities in particular. We've got a lot of talented and bright people that are not being engaged in the economy the way we need them to be. We have a lot of jobs that are going empty. Our business world is still predominantly being run by white males. And frankly, uh, diverse voices make our businesses stronger. They make our products and services better. And they make our uh, economy stronger. And interestingly, to have a viable chance at real economic and transformative growth in our region, both equity and, and inclusion have to cut across everything and every aspect of economic development from cluster building, talent strategies and attraction, to education, to workforce development, and to business support services. And this can't just trickle down from the top. It needs to involve players and stakeholders at all levels and around the tables where decisions are made. And frankly, racism and racist policies are holding us back economically. Thank you. Thank you so much, Heidi, for that answer. Um, Dr. Kendi, if you could even dig in deeper, um, obviously this is an issue across the nation, but if you could identify key racist players, programs, policies that are really shaping our nation economically today. Where do we begin? <laughs> So I think just to sort of lay this sort of statistical ground 
First, uh, for the last 50 years, the, the black unemployment rate has been twice as high as the white unemployment rate in this country. The black white median wealth in this country is 10 times black median wealth. And forecasters are estimating that that disparity is growing. Uh, a, a new report recently came out that found that tw by 2053, between now and 2053, white median wealth is expected to grow, while black median wealth by 2053 is expected to redline at zero dollars. Latinx median wealth is expected to redline at zero dollars two decades after that. And so we have a growing racial wealth gap. We have a persisting gap in, in unemployment. As it relates to sort of wealth, um, I mean, first and foremost, when you have a sort of a tax bill uh, that sort of benefits the super rich and black people are disproportionately outside of the super rich, that's only going to grow racial inequity as relates to wealth. When you have it such that, that, that black people and Latinx people in their prime working ages are being mass incarcerated, that also results in a difficulty for those people to start building wealth, and it also results in them being more likely to be unemployed when they leave prisons. You know, I can go on and on, but I mean, I, I think that, and then I'll just say lastly, housing. Um, when we have this collective perspective that the more white people in a particular neighborhood, the more valuable uh, that neighborhood is, the more black people in the neighborhood, the more dangerous it is, that affects housing values in those neighborhoods. So studies find that you have black and you have houses in majority black and majority white neighborhoods of equal stock. In other words, they're very similar, but the house in the majority white neighborhood is more likely to grow in value. So you have two homeowners who are doing exactly what they're supposed to be doing, but the white-owned homeowner is more likely to essentially be able to build wealth uh, through his or her home, just by the mere nature of the way in which people conceive of, of space in this country. No, thank you. That was an amazing answer. Um, I think we would love if you continued all day, though. <laughs> Um, our next question is going to be for Dr. Lucas, I believe. Yes. Dr. Lucas, how can white people use their privilege to make Rochester a truly equitable community? Oh, great question, Kiori. Thank you. Um, first, I would say that white people have to recognize that they have privilege. Uh, there are still so many people that don't believe white privilege exists or that uh, they get any benefit from the system just because of their whiteness. So that would be the first thing. Uh, next, I would say that uh, we have to start learning, understanding, and telling the truth about our shared history of oppression and subjugation and terror that were experienced by people of color. And we have to start teaching that so that we're speaking truth to power. Uh, third, I would say that white people have to use their privilege to start changing the racist policies that we all live under. We can outline, as Dr. Kendi just started doing, uh, all of the policies that have kept communities marginalized and underprivileged. And if we have underprivileged communities, then we know we have overprivileged communities. And so we have to have white people use that overprivilege to start leveling the playing field for everybody. And Dr. Kendi, I also want to ask you, but I kind of want to flip that question a little bit and help our audience understand, um, what are the limitations or the possible pitfalls of using white supremacy as we fight, you know, and we become anti-racist? Ask that again. Um, I was just wondering, what are the limitations, the possible pitfalls of using um, white privilege as we, yes. 
So I think, you know, as the sister just stated, that it's critically important for, for people to, for white people to recognize their privileges. And just to give one example, um, I often talk to poor whites who are like, how can I have privilege? I'm poor. And, you know, my response is that, uh, generally speaking in this country, if you're poor and white, you're more likely to live in a mixed income neighborhood than if you're poor and black. And, and so to give an example, in Chicago, a white poor person is 10 times, I should say a black poor person is 10 times more likely to live in a high poverty neighborhood than a white poor person. And so what happens if you're white and poor, you're more likely to be able to send your kid to a middle income school, which then provides them, let's say, with, with opportunities that, that if you're poor and black, you're not necessarily able to. So, but I think it's also critical for white people and really for all people to recognize the inverse of white privilege, and that is black deprivation. And so what happens is if, if white people are privileged with particular things, those very same things black people are deprived of. And so to give an example, I recently wrote an essay in The Atlantic that, that argued that the greatest white privilege is life itself. And, and the greatest black deprivation is life itself. That uh, it was in reference to Congressman Cummings' death, uh, who of course was, for those of you who may not have seen, a, you know, a recent uh, a Baltimore congressman who tussled with Trump this summer died at 68 years old. And black men on average live only 72 years, which is less than every other racial gender group in this country. And, and so just by the nature of being black, you're less likely to live. Just by the mere nature of being white, you're more likely to live. And I think it's critical for us to, to recognize what people are deprived of. People are deprived of resources. People are deprived of opportunity. Even black people are deprived of their individuality. In other words, when, when people view a single black person as representing the entire race, that doesn't allow that individual to make mistakes. That individual has to essentially carry tens of millions of people on their shoulder. Black people are not allowed the, are deprived of the presumption of innocence. You know, I know in my dealings with police, how often they view me as a suspect until proven otherwise. While if a white person has an, has an AR-15, they may be more likely to, be, to have a presumption of innocence than me being unarmed. Let me stop there. <laughs> and I think Junalisa has our next question. Yep. Mr. De Guzman, as we fight for an anti-racist community, how do we make sure Latinx communities are not left out? Thank you for that question. I, it's something that I had to really think about how I wanted to answer it. And you know, um, how do you answer that in a hyper-segregated city like Rochester is? We are hyper-segregated, which means that we're more segregated than most of the country, as liberal as we would like to portray that we are. And so it's important that we're very intentional about inclusion. So while Latinx means something very rich culturally and there's a historical um, meaning to it and contemporary meaning, it's nowhere in the demographics of Rochester. And from a policy perspective, it's really hard to actually affect change if it's not in the demographics. And in fact, I pulled up the recent demographics. It's something that I look at in my work often. And it, this is by ACS from 2017, white, well, this is with the city of Rochester, white people in Rochester are supposedly comprised 46.58%, black or African American 40.71%, two or more races 4.55%, other race 3.83%, Asian 3.31%, Native American 0.99%, Native Hawaiian or Pacific Islander 0.03%. Where are Latinx? 
So how you pose, you know, how you actually, from a policy perspective, it's hard, hard to make sure that inclusion is actually happening. And it, I would also um, challenge the people who are coming up with that question to realize that the way that the census and all of that was set up was racist and was a, as a way to divide and conquer and actually make sure that the majority of minority or of people that are marginalized in Rochester, which are African American or black, are separated in some profound numbers ways from Latinx people, when Latinx does not, Hispanic, which is actually on the census, is not a race. So it's hard to actually, I think we have to be very intentional in making sure we hold people to account, even though it's almost like a donut hole that Latinx people can fall into being 17%, roughly 17% of Rochester in a country that is actually where you have the browning of America happening much faster, it's imperative that we actually push back and actually help to redefine and um, hold people accountable to the Latinx community here in Rochester. So Dr. Kennedy, I mean, you've already kind of discussed this with some of the stats that you mentioned earlier. Um, both of these communities are very similar, especially when it comes to wealth, when it comes to housing, um, those kinds of things. But can you discuss why this divide still exists and who it helps? The divide between African Americans and Latinx Americans? Or perceived divide? So, I mean, for instance, you currently have African Americans who believe that Latinx immigrants are taking away their jobs. And they are supporting politicians who are making this claim. Even though studies show that when you have a high, when you have an intrusion of immigrants in a community, it actually creates jobs. It actually doesn't result in the, the like, <laughs> but, but you know, African Americans who of course are struggling at the lower end of the economic ladder alongside Latinx Americans um, are looking for the problem and they're constantly taught that that problem is other people. And so too are Latinx Americans taught that the problem is African Americans, just as white Americans are taught that the problem is, is people of color. And who does this benefit? It, it, it benefits certainly those who would rather have us divided. You know, you, let's give an example. Let's say if, you know, we had a white factory owner who had white workers, black workers, and Latinx workers, and the white workers made $16 an hour. The black workers made $12 an hour. And the Latinx workers made $11 an hour. And all three of those workers should be making $35 an hour. <laughs> How does that factory owner ensure that those workers do not make what they should be making by keeping them divided? Oh, I'm not gonna you know, join a union with those Latinx workers, with those white workers, they're my enemy. And so then they're easily able to be divided and conquered. One of the ironic things about what's happening now, particularly as it relates to the dialogue and the vicious assaults against, against immigrants of color. And, you know, Latinx immigrants, of course, even immigrants from, from Nigeria and Haiti, is that a century ago, these immigrants were people from Italy, was people from Ireland, was people from Russia and Poland, were people from Spain. And these people from Ireland and, and Southern and Eastern Europe were classified in the same way people of color who are immigrants are classified today. That these people are ruining this country and we need to keep this country pure. And to be pure was to be white. And the movement was so strong against these European immigrants that Congress in 1924 passed an Immigration Act that pretty much 
reduced the number of Europeans coming from central, I should say, Eastern and, 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 and Southern Europe, pretty much banned Asians, and limited the number of people coming from Africa. And what's ironic is their grandchildren are ironically saying the same thing about people of color that was said about them. Last I checked, these people didn't ruin this country, just as people of color who are coming into this country won't ruin it either. Mr. White, how is my education affected by the color of my skin and ethnicity and where I go to school? Um, I think the most important thing to understand is you are being educated in a system that was never intended to educate you in the first place. It's, it's very clear when you look at history, actually, <laughs> Public education was more of an incubator for these racist ideas <laughs> that Dr. Kennedy was talking about, um, as opposed to an institution that really fed everybody that was here in this country. Um, so as a result, many communities of color in this country have had to advocate to be included into the system that was never intended for them in the first place. And um, one major victory, one of them was Mendez versus Westminster, which actually um, disallowed segregation of Mexican Americans um, in the public school system. But then another one was Brown versus Board. Are you familiar with Brown versus Board? Did you hear about it in uh, history class? Um, Dr. Kennedy talks a lot about racist policy, right? And so this was intended to be a racially forward policy, I guess, but there's some language in it that says that integration, making sure that all students get an equal education and are integrated, needs to happen at all deliberate speed, right? You know what that means? Does anybody know what all deliberate speed means? Like, it, some people saying fast, some people saying slow, but it's really open for interpretation, right? And I would argue that the language is kind of vague for that purpose, because you could go deliberately slow in making sure that black and brown kids get included into this public education system. So, after that major victory, what a lot of white folks started doing was moving out of the cities, right? They started keeping the jobs as teachers while getting rid of the jobs of a lot of Latinx and black and brown teachers. So that's why you don't have that many black and brown teachers today, right? They started doing something called tracking, which was determining who deserves what kind of education, right? Then they started with that kind of racial thought and ideas, it started saying who deserves to be in SPED and who doesn't, or special education, who doesn't. Not necessarily based on capability, but based off of what appearance was or what cultural presentation of knowledge looked like, right? And now you fast forward and you have a school district like the one you operate in, <laughs> where you can go all day and not see that many white folks in your student body, but see a lot of them in staff, right? So what does that actually look like in terms of the quality of your education? As a result of this history, you're, more, you're less likely, the stats prove, actually there's this um, free to access a report called the opportunity myth that the new teacher uh, project did that showed that white students are way more likely to have grade level content, right? They're way more likely to find their school experience engaging. Right, so you are kind of robbed of that, or you're more likely to be robbed of that. You're more likely to be put in a um, classification that you may not necessarily need because there's a misdiagnosis of black and brown kids in special education all the time because they're not culturally understood, right, or linguistically understood because they may speak another language. Um, you're less likely to be in AP courses. You're less likely to be in gifted pr uh, programs. So it's really important for you to understand that while for white folks, school was created for them to use, for y'all, school was created to use you. So in knowing that though, you come from a long line of ingenious, intellectual, creative people who know how to flip the situation. Frederick Douglass was one of them, right? Um, quick story about what happened in Rochester, actually. Um, that book, The Narrative of the Life of Frederick Douglass, 
Rochester's a quasi-native, right? He spent a lot of his time here and uh, lived here. Um, it was given out to all the kids in the district before. That book is so much about how education can emancipate people and free people, but that message, when it gets taught oftentimes, is not communicated, right? So, but one, one young lady, I forget her name, she did an essay about the story, and she said, oh, this book is about how reading will free people. And I see how my teachers aren't really giving me that access to literacy, so therefore they're putting me in a situation kind of like how Frederick Douglass was. She wrote this out in a nice long essay, but the teacher got mad, the community got, or the, the educator community in that building got mad, and she got suspended. So this is the kind of atmosphere, unfortunately, that you may have to encounter. Um, but I like to think, and I like to know, especially since I know the teacher that uh, brought you guys here, that there are a lot of people that are aware of that, that like to teach you about the entire history and everything you have to navigate in the system to make sure that you're a critical thinker and that you're able to survive and use school instead of school using you. And I mean, you've already discussed how segregation, racism, it also harms white people. Um, but can you discuss this from a student perspective and how, um, you know, having racist educational curricula and those kinds of things also affect our white students as well? So a study recently came out that, that found that students of color prefer teachers of color. That study also found that white students prefer teachers of color. Um, and currently, at least in public schooling, 80% of the teachers are white. And, and so if it's the case that what these kids are desiring is indeed potentially better for them, and we don't really know why and how. I mean, there's a, many, of course, great white teachers. Um, then those even white students are being deprived. Um, because I think if we had a much more diverse teaching body, you know, it, it certainly would, would benefit white students too. And I also think, obviously, if you have teachers of color um, or even anti-racist white teachers, then they're more likely to teach a curriculum that doesn't standardize white people. And when you live in a country that's browning, when you live in a world that's minority white, to be trained in a Eurocentric curriculum doesn't actually serve you well. Because you're not going to really be able to sort of understand, let alone interact with, people in your own community, let alone people across the world. But then not only that, you're not only going to be able, you're not going to be able to have access to the riches of literature and scientific concepts and philosophy that is put forth by non-white people. And, you know, one of the benefits, I think, that people of color have, particularly people of color who, are, who have parents who are probably giving them a second curriculum <laughs> of, of literature of people of color, is they're getting access to all literature. While white students who are coming up in these Eurocentric home and Eurocentric schools are more likely to get a single literature, which then I think is making it more difficult for them. And so, you know, I mean, to me, you know, having a more anti-racist curriculum, having a more diverse set of teachers is certainly going to be better for those students. And then it's gonna be better for the parents because then the, parent, the students are gonna go back to their parents They'd be like, who are you voting for? <laughs> Ms. Zimmer Meyer and anyone else that would like to respond, who should lead the way in race equity, government, business, or activists? I think it's everybody has responsibility, that's, that's point one. But I think that white people have uh, a much deeper road that, has to go, that we have to go down. 
And I, you know, get t tying to uh, what Mr. Kendi, Dr. Kendi, has just said about uh, education, that one of the things I think that makes it difficult for a lot of white people um, in the U.S. today is that we're not taught um, almost anything about the black experience, the great black migration, about modern thought, um, perceptions about society, about laws, about a lot of things. And when you, as a white person, begin to delve into what's being written and what's being said, you begin to realize we were never taught any of this. And so when you combine that with communities like ours that are very racially divided in terms of where people live, in terms of where people go to, to religious services, where they socialize, how much human contact people have. I think it, it ends up creating an unbelievably divided world. And so if we're gonna get past that, and I think in this community, we are for the first time starting to break through some of this, I don't think we can do that without talking to each other and without, on, on the white side of the discussion, I think that uh, we've got a lot to learn, a lot to read, a lot to understand that's been missing in our own education. So I think we've got to start with that. I know that there are groups that have begun to happen in, in this particular community where people are talking to each other, they're talking about race, they're talking about their lived experiences. And frankly, uh, that, that's got to be one of the biggest ways as a community we've got to move this discussion forward. And, and I do, again, I can't say often enough, I think the whites among us in this community have a long path. And there's a lot of very deep work that has to be done and it's scary sometimes, it's unfamiliar, but I think it's absolutely essential. The, the, the last thing I'd throw onto this is that I also think that uh, what we do in the political sphere is absolutely essential. So if we're looking at what parts of our communities and our country are where change has to happen, we've got to have candidates of color, we have to have voters getting to the voting booths at the right times to make change happen because when we talk about deep-seated policies, and there are thousands of them, that in, in some ways have had good impacts on communities and people in other ways haven't. A lot of that happens in the political sphere. So we have got to get a much broader and more diverse group of people representing us locally all the way up to the White House. Okay. I just... I just want to add to that, that I also think we need to have clear goals and accountability. Because even though I, you know, I see some, I think that um, I went to this, um, the Art of, um, of Justice uh, through nine different series at NYU a couple years ago. And one of the things that um, Dr. Marta Morena Vega talked about was this opening and closing oppor times of opportunity. And she just looked at us and she said, you all think you're so special. You all think you're so special. We've been doing this. You, you, didn't re, you didn't invent this. This has been happening a long time. I think the change has to be that if people choose to lead, they need to be accountable for their leadership and there has to be change. And I think that that's really a difference that has to happen because right now, it's, you can put a good great goal out there, whether it's poverty, equity, community oriented or whatever. And it seems like we just morph into the next phase of something. And the people who have been leading that are never held accountable. And there's no regrouping and reassessing about what did not work. And I think that without that, I don't have a lot of optimism, even though I'm very optimistic in general. What I would, am I on? Yeah. Okay. What I would want to add to that is very specifically, I think that white men have to lead this. I think 
This is an issue that was created by white men, and it has to be dismantled by white men. Um, However, I don't believe that white men can do it alone because I don't think they would do it right. <laughs> Perfect. Brandon, do you want to add five seconds to that or? Um, yes, um, you said, what was the question again? I just want to make sure I have all the categories right. Moderate it. Okay. Who should lead the way in, in race equity, government, business, or activists? Government, business, or activists. Government and business needs to behave more like activists. That's it. All three of them need to be doing it simultaneously, and that will happen when government and business behave more like activists. And, and if I could say very briefly, to sort of continue to talk about accountability so I define an anti-racist policy as any policy that yields racial equity or reduces racial inequity. And so fundamentally, it's about outcome. And, and that's all we should be concerned about. And then also in terms of activists, we have a lot of people who self-identify themselves as activists. Um, and I define, uh, see these definitions. I mean, we have, to, we have to be clear about definitions. I define an activist as someone with a record of power or policy change. And so in other words, you just don't decide one day you're gonna be an activist. <laughs> just like somebody just doesn't decide one day they're gonna be a doctor, right? You literally have to have a record to show for yourself. Ms. Lucas, does race equity mean changing the power structure of Rochester? I think in order for us to achieve racial equity, we have to change a lot of things. And I think it starts with changing the hearts and minds of people. Um, it, going back to what, we, what was said many times before is learning the history, uh, understanding uh, what we don't know, um, and unlearning basically everything that we have learned so far, right? Unlearning um, all of that. So it starts with changing our hearts and minds. Uh, once that happens, then we can start moving towards equity, right? And that means bringing all of the voices to the table that need to be at the table and letting people speak and letting them be heard and valuing what is said at that table, and making shared decisions at that table. Right? So inev inevitably, the power structure may change because as more people get power, understand their power, get power, and use that power to make change, uh, the structure will change. <laughs> Perfect, and I would also like to add to that, um, I guess just as we're thinking about what power structures are and fighting racism, um, what does an equitable power structure look like? It's obviously not enough to elect black people. So I think we should think of power in three different sort of ways. The first, every single individual has the power to resist, has the power to resist policies has the power to resist policymakers, and, and Frederick Douglass taught us that. The ultimate form of power in this country, like other countries, is policy-making power. And, and these are the people who literally have the ability to make and shape and break policies, whether at a city level, at an institutional level, at a national level, um, that shape that sort of govern the behavior or the abilities of people. So policies allow basically say no and yes to people. But then we also have 
what's called policy managers. And so other people make policies, and then there are people who execute these policies. So to truly have an equitable power structure, we would literally, like the poli po people in policy making positions across institutions, across cities, across nations, they would be representative of the populations in that particular uh, community. Not only at a policy making level, but at a policy managing level. And if not representative, at least for those people to be anti-racist. And if they're anti-racist, then their policies are going to lead to more equitable representation. And so for me, I'm actually at this point, I'm more interested in getting people in positions of policy making power who are anti-racist than I am people who are, let's say, people of color. Because if there's anything, <laughs> because you know, when people like Kanye West say they're running for president, that's not the type of black person that I actually want in a policy making <laughs> position. So I think we are out of time. Thank you all so much. Please, please sit around, talk about this, and get to work tomorrow. Thank you.